Okay, now we have some time for, for questions. And uh, as our panelists are getting set up, I'm gonna uh, pose the, the first question. We've, we've heard about uh, persuasive technologies and um, multimodal gaming and information therapy. What is the, the business case for, for these strategies? Um, does it exist and what are, are the components of the business case that uh, justify the, the cost in, in terms of the benefits that can be derived from, from these tools and approaches? Question for any and all of our, uh, all of the panelists. Well, I think um, you know when you heard from uh, Jan uh, from Kaiser this morning, you heard from a, an integrated delivery system. The business case, obviously, it's pretty clear for them. Um, they've you know they're reducing a lot of unnecessary visits. They're reducing a lot of unnecessary phone calls, um, and they're you know increasing uh, satisfaction, which could increase their en enrollment in their health plan, uh, increase market share, and things like that. So in that kind of situation, um, all of the uh, incentives, in a sense, are aligned. Um, the question is, what, what about the rest of, of the healthcare delivery system? And I think that that's a big challenge for us. And one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to um, better define what constitutes information therapy intervention so that we can uh, drive market rewards for them. And so we're now working with accreditation organizations, pay for performance programs, and others to try to integrate that into um, the incentive systems for uh, providers. I do have an answer. In 1850, we were starting to use clocks to figure out how, how long it takes us to do stuff, and we started to organize our, our lives according to hours and minutes. Well, at this time, we are compelled to organize our lives not only in terms of hours and minutes, but also in terms of carbon dioxide and uh, uh, pollution. Uh, these, these become decision-making factors, and we simply can't afford not to know uh, what our impact on the environment is and, and what, our impact, what the impact on the environment on our health is. So that will be as important as our daily schedule in terms of hours. So it's huge. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a good metaphor. I, um, because we're at the early stages of these um, persuasive technologies, um, most of the applications we're trying to improve the efficiency of some existing care system. Um, in India, it's a vast uh, human system, uh, which is a, a large fraction of their entire health budget. And um, even small increments in its, its effectiveness are uh, usually very, very cost effective. And I think the, the graph also that uh, Kalavi showed is we're very much in the steep part of this curve where um, investment in these persuasive technologies usually prov provides uh, um, a very high um, increase in outcome. Uh, and we're only talking about information. It's, in, it's a inexpensively replicable. And, and generally, it's a very cost-effective technique, I would say. And um, I think looking from the point of view of the national economy, I think... Um, Finland being a Scandinavian country and having a 80% public funded uh, healthcare system, I think we don't have a choice. We have to take all the citizens into the game. We have to empower them. We have to educate them. And they have to take a bigger role of, of taking care of their own health and keeping themselves healthy. I think we cannot continue with the existing service system, even though we could have the money to do that, uh, which is a big issue. We pay almost as much taxes as the Danish, so uh, it's a big issue. But I think uh, the biggest issue is that we don't have enough people to take care of us when we get old. It's, it's the reality. We, we should uh, have 300,000 more people within 10 years, which is almost... Uh, 10% of the Finnish population just to take care of each other. It's, it's an, it doesn't just go like that. So we have to renew our service system. And I, I believe strongly that the way is that we have to get a more educated patient, more educated citizens, and take them taking more responsibility of being active part of the health system. Thank you. Questions from the audience? And, and please, again, wait for the mic before you speak. Um, yes, I have a question regarding the targeted um, um, uh, searching. Um, it's not a dissimilar concept from a lot of other searches that build on 
um, information already accessed on other, other techniques. Uh, what technologies do you envision to use for that? And are there companies or universities who are working on that? I'm directing it to the... <laughs> to you. Josh. So you were asking about targeting, targeted searching. So there are some um, some search engines that have been that are being developed in you know in healthcare. Um, you know, Healthline is one that's that's local, um, but there there are others as well. I think that the um, and they're trying to use um, sort of more sophisticated uh, semantic algorithms to to do that. Um, and you can see Google Health now; they're trying to do some of that as well. Um, and I think that that can get us part of the way. Um, one of the things that um, I, I didn't uh, emphasize enough, though, I think, is that um, there's probably still going to be a certain amount of need for um, interaction between humans and computers to guide people to the right information. And um, the, the points made about community health workers, something that we've been uh, working on as well, is, is really important because there are a lot of opportunities to use um, uh, so people who aren't necessarily trained in healthcare per se to help deliver health information and in some cases may be more effective in doing so, particularly in certain communities um, in, in where there's a lot of diversity, um, really deploying people who are um, uh, more like the people that they're trying to serve can be very valuable. Next question. I'm curious in the Finnish uh, uh, experience of opening up that uh, information database that physicians use to the general public, if uh, there was any need to uh, come up with an alternate uh, uh, presentation of the information. Because in the United States, uh, there's lots of uh, attempts to figure out how to take very complex medical information and, and somehow recast it so that it could be uh, readily uh, understood by lay people. Yes, it was. Um, so it's not purely exactly the same data delivered to the public. Uh, it has been modified so that it's, it's more readable. But the links, for instance, to the articles exist there so that if you want, you can go then to the, exactly to the medical science based articles and look from the additional information from there. But it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit modified, yes. Other questions? In the back? Uh, this, this is for John. When you were doing your research in India, did you uh, look at incomplete sources, stories versus complete stories? I'm not sure I completely caught the question. So the, did we look at which kind of stories? Uh, complete stories versus incomplete stories. So I'm not sure we, um, I, we, we were trying to look at interactive stories where um, there's a, a, where we involve the, um, the subject in ki a, a kind of a dialogue where they can make choices and some of the choices may uh, produce bad outcomes and other choices produce good outcomes. So the, that kind of teaching is the most effective in the sense that, the, that they really experience the, um, the consequences of the decision, perhaps rather than just being told. So the, there's an attention to the structure of stories, um, you know, it, it, in terms of making them also very effective at teaching. I'm not sure I'm getting your question, but... An in, incomplete story is where a person um, is makes up the ending of the story. And what's sometimes helpful in social situations is where you have a shared experience of having an incomplete story. So in other words, if like five people are working through technology, they're using the same incomplete story and they're coming up with con con endings and they talk about the endings. Oh, okay, I see, yes. And then by, so that way you have both the technology aspect but you also have the social aspect that they're sharing their experiences and they also learn and it's also a way of reinforcing uh, what's what's learned. So the inf reinforcement is not only through the technology, but it's also through the peer social aspects. No, I think that seems like a, re a reasonable design. We're, we're just perhaps less familiar with that particular design, but it does sound promising, yeah. All these questions about 
making data work for people remind me of the fact that it took us as a society, it took us maybe 50 years to understand time. I mean, kids would go to school and learn about the clock, right, and watch the second hand sweep and that would be a lesson. And so it may take us another 50 years to figure out how to use certain types of data that we now have available. And it's not just that we make it simple so everybody can understand it, but that rather that everybody starts studying up to a level where, where that data makes sense. So it's a massive education project as well. Question in the front. Um, thanks. Um, this is for any of you, but a lot of what you described seems to work really well for children and for younger adults, particularly with the gaming and the the tools, et cetera. But as you know, when we look at healthcare, it's really the aging population that is really the cost, the chronic disease management um, that is really impacting um, our healthcare delivery system. So I was wondering what activities you were doing in trying to address the information needs or how do you persuade in the aging and the older population? Good question. I, I happen to have been teaching a class about game design. So one thing I would point out is that, that, that the elder population is a very rapidly growing fraction of the game market. I think something like 30% over 50 now. The median age is, a, is uh, in high 30s. So actually, um, you know, as, as elders are becoming more comfortable with uh, computers, there, there is a big growth in, in gaming. Uh, and there are genres of games that are directed more at, uh, um, at elders. Uh, so. I'm, I, it doesn't seem like it's necessary to completely switch uh, uh, emphasis or media. One can still think about games, but one just wants to think about uh, the needs of elders. I, I, I'll leave it there. There, there. there are issues reaching the, the elders that don't play games, though, which I, perhaps someone else might want to take that one out. Okay, I, I think um, based on the experiences in Finland, we have also quite a lot of this type of activities uh, supporting with information the independent living and, and supporting people uh, living in their homes. And, uh, but I think one lesson which we have learned at the first, uh, if you talk about senior people, they are not a homogeneous group. It's a very diversified. They are individuals. And we are going to be more and more individuals when we get older, that's for sure. So we are much more difficult, again, to the services. But uh, I think it's not a question of age. It's a question of um, your functional capabilities. Uh, it's old people. We have had in projects 85-year-old lady who was the first one to adapt, for instance, a video negotiation system. So it's, it's very, very different. Then we can have people having severe di di diseases in their working age and they are not able to use these kind of systems. So I think the question is that we have to be able to give uh, opportunities to those people who are able to use this and them to be more active so we get more hands to those who really need more, more care than, than the other ones. And there's also potential for games to act as intergenerational bonds. Um, I, I, we saw a case where a grandfather was playing with his grandson. Both of them had fragile X uh, situations. Uh, the, the grandfather was much older, of course, and had age uh, in addition, but the grandson had a much stronger expression of fragile X. and suffer, uh, So they actually competed with each other in this game uh, at the same level. So the, the game leveled the playing field for these two generations to come together. And, and that's another other special effects. So where there are people we lose, where, where we lose people because it's a game, we also win uh, opportunities to connect people uh, to other generations. So I, also, uh, it's all, also a media question because seniors do play a lot of games. They play card games and all sorts of things. And, and so it's not the game metaphor that's a problem, but it's the media metaphor that's sometimes a problem. I think we have time for one last question before lunch. Uh, see, all you talked about is a wonderful uh, story and a wonderful idea and one wonderful uh, execution. But uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, this uh, looks like a kind of mosaic, uh, another word, uh, not interoperable and uh, not talked together so far. And uh, uh, very optimistically, uh, it will be uh, overcrowded uh, very near future. I mean, uh, as of chaotic situation soon. 
So the question is, uh, are there any action uh, to make this change? I mean, a kind of uh, maybe platform uh, on that uh, you, uh, your ideas talk together? Or uh, another question is, what uh, possible uh, platform to make happen? What kind of platform you need? Yes. No, um, I, my, my experience is more on this well-being and, and health issue. So I think if it look for the devices like mobile phones and their health, health functions and uh, uh, different kind of uh, pulse meters like Polar or Suntos devices, I think, and the whole monitoring devices, I think there is a very strong initiative called Continua Health Alliance that is working on those issues. I think they seem to be able to uh, build up the connectivity between uh, these uh, different devices. I, and I think that's the first step. And then the second step is that how we really uh, build up the uh, healthcare IT systems to utilize these, these devices. But uh, I think there is quite strong international uh, standard, uh, HL7, this type of organization, IHA, working on these issues. Um, I think technically we may, may reach the standards, but really I think the challenge is how, how about then the service standards? I think that's something which I think it was a good question. No one is really working on those. Any other thoughts about standards, platforms, or interoperability? Um, this interoperability, as I said, it's on the technical level, it's reachable. I believe on that. It's e easy. But then um, if we think about the user, um, so that you would have the same user experience, depend on the, depending on that, that if you are in, 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 in States or are in, in Europe, I think there's a long way to go. That's the, because the services are so different. So I think that will be a challenge. I, I don't know any existing activities. In Europe, of course, European Union is trying to make the Europe as a one, one service system, but there still we have very strong national borders. It takes for 40 years until we have something in Europe, so you are ahead actually on that. Yeah, just, just to build on that, I think um, I agree that sort of the technology standards I think are, are really on the right track. I think the question is um, for the, the end user, for the consumer, um, and one of the things that we're interested in is really um, how do you ensure that the um, content can be integrated? And, and when you have tools coming from different organizations, even if um, from a technological standpoint things can fit together, there's an interoperability around integrating different tools uh, in terms of the content and how they uh, describe uh, health issues that, that can be um, a challenge. All right, well, thank you very much, panelists, and, and would you join me in welcoming them?